Hi, my name is Rick Hartwig. Uh, I'm the Built Environment Lead for the Institution of Engineering and Technology. I'm really delighted this morning to be talking to Jacob Heath Matassian, uh, who is with a company called Bowtie Construction. Uh, we first met uh, in March last year, uh, had a conversation with him at that event, and we're now following the story of what they have done in the design competitions uh, and the project that's materializing. The aim of the design competition was to develop new approaches for high performance, scalable and cost-effective net zero retrofit solutions focused on apartment blocks. Hang up, maybe you just want to uh, introduce yourself briefly and, and your organization. Yeah, thanks Rick. Uh, thanks for having me here today. So I'm the innovation director. I joined the company as the business development manager about five years ago. Um, and we're focusing more and more on uh, large scale retrofit, uh, volume retrofit. We've got history of um, as being a passive house contractor. We've built many passive houses and passive house retrofits in and around London. And that has dovetailed nicely into Energy Sprong. So lots of our passive house experience and retrofit knowledge is going into our energy sprung retrofits. Um, I guess our landmark project, you can see kind of in the middle of the screen there, the brown timber building is Max Fordham House. Um, that is built as a retirement home for the renowned building services engineer and Spitfire pilot who founded Max Fordham LLP. Um, and that has no wet heating system. In fact, no heating system at all. It basically keeps itself comfortable throughout the year by having a very, very efficient um, thermal envelope. And we've won two uh, RIBA awards for that building and SIBSI project of the year. Thank, thank you. The uh, project you focused on is, is looking at uh, a retrofit uh, solution, for, a deep retrofit solution, I should rather say, for Treadgold House uh, in Lancaster West Estate in London. Um, maybe you just want to, talk through the, the broad concept of what you're, you're trying to do uh, at Dread Gold House. Yeah, a bit of context on the project. Um, the Lancaster West Estate, they always planned to refurbish the whole estate. Um, and then when the Grand tragedy happened, it kind of shifted the focus of that. Um, and you can see Tread Gold House is right there in the shadow of Grenfell. So the, the focus with this, this uh, refurb and this design was to bring Treadgold House to net zero carbon, but to do it in the most fire safe possible way. So from our starting point, we wanted to make sure that we'd meet 2018 amended building regulations, which were amended as part of the Grenfell tragedy uh, to have a very strong Euro class fire rating. Um, so you can see here a very dated 60s block. Um, it's so dated, in fact, that these flats actually have chimneys for coal fires, but they have fireplaces. Um, and it's just in, in dire need of, of some love. So the love you're referring to um, is, is essentially cladding the building and doing some interesting things to the building. Maybe you can just share with us briefly uh, the, the concept, the energy sprung concept that you've applied here, if it is indeed. But... Yeah, indeed, yeah, it, it is energy sprung. Um, and it can also be passive house compliant, depending on how far the client wants to go. Um, so the broad brush strokes are, we would remove the existing balconies, which constitute an extreme thermal bridge. And that is a way for heat. They act as a heat sink, effectively sucking heat from the core of the building, um, out to the sort of cold exterior temperature in winter. So we remove those, those balconies and we then fit external wall panels which are steel frame structure insulated with about 150 mil of rock wall. And they are fitted to the whole of all of the elevations going around the building. We then fit new freestanding offsite manufactured steel balconies. So the weight of those balconies goes down to the ground and they're located to the building. We fit a new uh, warm roof, which creates that sort of cheese wedge shape that you can see from the steel frame on the drawing. And in that roof, that roof becomes a new loft for um, services equipment. So um, air source heat pumps and ventilation equipment. Um, everything's manufactured off site. It's brought on site on a just in time basis. And another view here showing those balconies. Um, these balconies are double the size of the previous balconies. Um, and that was important to us as a way of really giving the residents 
something beyond just saying you're now going to live in a net zero carbon building and you'll have lower heating bills. We wanted to in increase everyone's immunity space and for that space to be more pleasant and more useful. I think at the end of the day, um, the, the project is really aimed at helping the life of the residents. Um, and uh, fuel poverty is a real issue um, right across the country. We have such en energy inefficient buildings that people are spending more than they need to on unhealthy buildings to a, a lot of power to to uh, warm heat unhealthy buildings. Maybe you can just talk through some of the, the, the opportunities that have come out of, uh, out of the project. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I came into sustainable construction really as an environmental activist. Um, and I, I saw this as one of the main ways we could really help fix some of the global problems you know, going beyond trying to push government to do things and, and waving placards at demonstrations. And the thing that really attracted me to Passive House, is, and this is one of the lesser known things about Passive House, but in order to, to, to certify a Passive House building, during the design process, the modeling essentially won't let you pass your design unless you design a building in which all su surfaces never fall below 19 degrees. And that eradicates damp and mold. And it also means that even if you don't have any money at all to run your heating system, your house will still stay at a pretty livable temperature. Yeah. And, and the design for Treadgold House, you know, we used uh, the Passive House planning package and, and modeling and all our, all our Passive House knowledge from 10 years of delivering these project, projects. So we know that even if someone doesn't have enough money to run their heating for the month, they're not going to be freezing cold and they're not going to be unwell as a result of being cold. So this is a massive gift, I'd say, to the residents of this building um, and anyone that ends up living in, in one of these types of buildings. So you've obviously taken out the gas. Uh, emissions has, has dropped uh, considerably. Uh, what's not known is the amount of nitrous oxides that is What's not genuinely recognised, I should perhaps say, is the amount of nitrous oxides generated by the conventional boilers. Um, these numbers are quite staggering. Yeah, it's interesting because it's something that, I mean, gas somehow has got this reputation of being a really clean fossil fuel. Um, maybe it's the cleanest, but actually it is still pumping out, you know, combustion of gas still pumps out a lot of quite harmful um, toxins. Um, nitrous oxide, no, is, is poisonous. It's the same, one of the same emissions from, from burning, um, diesel. Um, and then the, the figures on the screen right now, are what we calculated as being the result of one year's gas consumption, uh, from the 38 tread gold flats. So totaling 417 tons of CO2 and 1.2 tons of nitrous oxide. And so another benefit, again, often not talked about of a net zero carbon retrofit, but so once the retrofit's completed, these gases are no longer being emitted. So if, if you're a resident and you support this retrofit and you say, yes, I want it, you're actually taking active steps to improving your local environment. You know, you're, you're improving the, the quality of the air where you live. You're going to be reducing incidences of asthma and um, it will smell nicer too. <laughs> Yep. Yep. And, and obviously, uh, the, the, the impact on the energy spend, uh, to, to heat that space is, is, is really significant. Yeah, it is. So we've, I've tabled here some of the kind of typical building types that we're used to seeing for most people, it's going to be the Victorian house, somewhere between the Victorian house and the new build house are the typical energy consumptions of buildings in the UK. Um, you can see what passive house would typically deliver. And then the tread gold house bow tie sprung is even better than that. And that is because when you retrofit a large building with many flats and many of these flats will only have a single external wall, you get a huge, um, increase in efficiency by the fact that, you know, you're only, you're, you're, you're treating the elevation, you're treating the outside of the building, but there are many, many individual units within that building. So the kind of passive internal heat gains that these, these buildings have from things like fridges and warm showers, once you insulate the building, they're, they're kept in the building really well. Yep. 
I, I, I support that entirely. Um, the one thing about the, the, the project, the, the whole idea was that the residents would remain in situ during the life of the project. That must have been uh, quite a hard uh, sell. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's part of the energy sprong concept, um, and it's part of what makes it attractive to councils. Because if a council wants, or a housing association wants to refurb a whole block, moving everyone out of those flats, putting them in temporary accommodation, and bringing them back, adds a huge amount to the budget, and it's a, it's a huge logistical challenge. You know, we, local authorities don't have empty blocks sitting around to put people in temporarily mm. while they're doing refurb work. Um, so, the resident engagement is really important. And it goes down to explaining to the residents what it is that's being proposed and also involving them in the process as far as co-design. So we partnered with social landscapes um, who are permaculture design specialists um, and permaculture is all about earth care, people care and fair shares. So it's about making sure that everything gets looked after in, in the design. And it's about asking residents what they want from the retrofit um, and that's where this imagery came from, is from that information gathering process, looking at the existing um, garden, how it could be improved, what residents really wanted. Um, and the sort of main response we got was a bit of a playscape because um, a lot of the kids are playing football right now in that car park and it's not very safe. So really a playscape for them. And one thing that, you know, we'd never have probably thought of if we hadn't asked the residents, but it was about making it more accessible by creating a path which you can see in this in this drawing that really frames um, the whole garden. And that was to create level access for elderly people, um, safe access, and really just to create a bit of a walking route. And, you know, you can imagine kids, um, toddlers taking their first steps around this garden. This garden is is the nearest green space for the 38 flats. So really about making this space as useful as possible and, and as, as pleasant and, and fun as possible. Um, for as many of the residents as possible. You, you've taken a similar approach to to the balconies. Uh, I was fascinated by by the amount of stuff you wanted to do on the balconies. Yeah, so we wanted each resident to be able to customize their balcony for their own like lifestyle. Um, some people might want to store bikes on their balconies. Um, some might want to grow food. You can see the middle side. There's some some wire coming down, and that's really um to prevent pigeons from being able to access the balconies because there is a big problem again we would never have known this if we hadn't asked the residents but a lot of them have problem with like really invasive pigeons um flying into their windows even and stealing their food from their kitchens so you know that why would be an option for certain people and it also makes it a little bit safer if you're someone with a two-year-old or a three-year-old who loves climbing um you know kids are known for that uh you, you would feel safer knowing that why was there so the manufacturing spec of each balcony would be the same, but there would be these certain customization points and the residents would be given a choice of how to customize it. And it even goes further into having like a volunteer gardening project where we would be, the residents would be sowing seeds for certain plants and those plants would then end up going into the planters on their balconies. And all of this has all the like knock on effects of um, giving giving residents a chance to meet each other and make friends and residents who maybe would never mix. Maybe they're from other ends of the block. Maybe they're very different ages or different backgrounds. They mix and they have this common shared experience yeah. and all of that, it leads to um, increased psychological resilience and just, you know, knowing your neighbors more and getting on with your neighbors more will always make you feel happier and safer in your home. The um, real challenge, I think that, the sector faces that's the housing sector faces is to scale this up um in such a way yeah you're talking here about 38 flats great concept great idea 38 happy families um uh but yeah we published a white paper uh, two three years back that was looking at scaling up of deep retrofit and how how we could do it and what are your plans for that so we were approached by Osborne, um, who saw some of the the press around this concept, um, and they asked if we would partner with them to help bring net zero carbon retrofit to a much bigger scale. And that's always been our goal as a company. We've 
previously done kind of individual houses, some quite big, some quite small, um, but we wanted to scale up. We don't want to do just one bow tie sprung retrofit a year. We want to do, you know, five, 10. And so working with a larger contractor where we're more focused on the, the scoping and the design uh, and the cost estimation as part of the design process and the energy modeling as part of the design process, we can then work in partnership with Osborne who can then actually build them out. The the technology you've you've adopted in in um, in running this this mixed reality you spoke of mixed reality uh, app that you had developed I'm I'm rather intrigued by by that yeah so this started as us wanting to be able to document our sites so that we would know where our service runs our pipes electrics junction boxes um, so that later down the line, if the client wanted to make changes or even during the construction process, sort of, you know, once the finishes start going on the wall and the client decides they want to move a socket or add a new socket, we could save ourselves a huge amount of time and expense by knowing where all these different elements were. So we now document all our sites with 360 photos uh, at first fixed stage. We then do this again at completion. And it means that the client then can then access this X-Ray 360 and they can stand at the spot where the photo was taken and they can move their smartphone around in order to see exactly where the service runs are. And, and finally, just to, to touch base uh, on, on the costs uh, implications of this, um, there's a lot of negative criticism out there about deep retrofit and how much it costs. Uh, you've, you've made quite a strong statement uh, in that regard. Perhaps you'd like to share that with us. Yeah, I think, you know, people really need to have a bit of imagination and they need to be a bit less pessimistic. Uh, we are at the beginning of the process. Um, you know, we have only got a few hundred or a few thousand deep retrofits in the UK. It's only, it's logical that by the time we have 10,000 and 100,000, these costs will drop. Um, there'll be a lot more people doing this kind of work. It won't be so alien and so specialist. Um, there will be tried and tested, tried and tested details and, and products on the market. And at, at Bowtie, we're developing some of those products and services to help um, increase reliability, increase programmability. So actually getting a real handle on how long each stage will take. Um, so it's all about industrializing the process, uh, using modern methods of construction. Um, in, in Innovate UK are really strongly supporting innovation in, in all these areas so that we can bring down the costs of net zero carbon retrofit and make it much more reliable. And, and, and also, as you point out in the slide, a much more investable uh, proposition because the finance is a key missing ingredient at the moment. The, the, because of the high cost, investors are staying out. They don't want to be involved. They just don't see it's worth it. But there are other benefits to that, as we've, we've spoken about before. Um, yeah, on the on the finance on noting finance, uh, one of the reasons that Energy Sprong is focusing on housing associations first is because they take a very long view on the maintenance of their buildings. Yeah. They'll have the main, the um, planned maintenance, you know, budgeted for thirty years into the future. So if you can do a retrofit, and you can then take some of those planned maintenance costs away because you're improving building fabric, and you're not just doing a band aid here and a band aid every kind of five years. You're actually installing something that's much higher quality and going to last a lot longer, then it makes sense to put more money into that retrofit. And then your, your payback period is also a lot longer. So that currently we say these retrofits will, will pay themselves back in, in 20 or 30 years. But as the costs drop and as more projects are, de are um, delivered and there are more products and services to bring those costs down, obviously that payback period will reduce. Yeah, uh, which is why when we uh, look at what you, you 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 talk about speed quality efficiency going up disruption cost and inconvenience going down big big factors in in making these decisions for all involved across the supply chain massive win for everyone the residents don't have all the noise and, and the upheaval of, of of the retrofit process taking as long um the actual components are manufactured to a very high accuracy because you don't have wind and rain Mm. Um, and there's much less waste. Yeah, which is really what we need in the industry. Uh, we need to make some impact. I'd like just to say uh, thank you to Hagap for joining us this morning, for sharing us the, 
developments on this really, really exciting project. Uh, and I do look forward to talking to you again as we follow the development of Trade Gold House Deep Retrofit. Thanks, Rick, and thanks to the IET for having us. You're most welcome.